Hello gem lovers, this is Justin K. Prim, and today I'm gonna to be looking at the connection between two topics that on first glance wouldn't seem to have anything to do with each other. The first is gothic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, and the second is the world of mineralogy. So let's check it out today on The Gem Cutter's Craft. So my major project of late has been searching for and reading letters associated with gem cutters from the 1920s and the 1930s as I explore the early history of American gem cutting. Completely aside from that, my sort of hobby reading for several years now has been the written works and letters of horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. Now, if you don't know about H.P. Lovecraft, he was the author of The Call of Cthulhu, Color Out of Space, At the Mountains of Madness, as well as many, many more horror short stories. He's also the writer who invented the fictional Necronomicon book, which has appeared in many fictional stories and movies such as Evil Dead and Jason Goes to Hell. As I've been going through these gem cutting letters and these gemology letters, Meanwhile, also at night, reading the personal correspondences of H.P. Lovecraft and his writer friends in New England, I always had this fantasy of like, wouldn't it be so great if I could sort of uncover some kind of weird distant connection, like somehow H.P. Lovecraft would have written a letter to some gem cutter somewhere that I was already doing research on. And to my great surprise, a few months back, I was listening to a podcast where they read these old H.P. Lovecraft letters. And to my astonishment, I started to hear familiar names, names that I knew from my gem cutting history journey being read from the words and letters of H.P. Lovecraft, and I just couldn't believe it. So I had to dig deeper into this and see what did H.P. Lovecraft even know about mineralogy or possibly even gem cutting. I couldn't believe that there was even an overlap here in these two areas of interest in my life, you know, dark, sort of archaic, gothic-esque horror short stories and mineralogy and gem cutting. They don't seem to go together, but here is the connection. His name is James F. Morton, and that's him there on the cover of The Oregon Mineralogist in March of 1934. So James F. Morton is our key figure, the key character that connects these two disparate topics together. So in 1934, James F. Morton got the cover story in the Oregon Mineralogist, which at that time was the newsletter of the Oregon Agate and Mineral Society. It was in only its first couple of years, almost immediately it became a very well-known nationwide publication that renamed itself simply The Mineralogist. So let's look into the issue and see exactly who is James F. Morton. So James Morton was the curator of the Patterson, New Jersey Museum and one of the leading mineralogists in the country. Morton built up the mineral collection at the Patterson Museum to the point where it was attracting national attention. And he was also a member of the National Amateur Press Association, which is how he knew of H.P. Lovecraft, who was also a member of this Amateur Press Association. James Morton was also a member of the Calum Club, which was uh, a sort of a loose band of fiction writers based in New York, of which H.P. Lovecraft was also a loose member. James Morton had several interests. For instance, he was also an anarchist writer and a political activist in the 1900s up to the 1920s. He was an amateur writer, he was a mineralogist, and of course he was the curator of the Patterson, New Jersey Museum. As I was looking for more information about James Morton, I looked for a book called The Letters to James F. Morton, which is part of the series of letters from H.P. Lovecraft. So H.P. Lovecraft and James F. Morton had a very long relationship over letter writing. And in this compilation of letters from H.P. Lovecraft to James F. Morton, we also have an appendix at the end that has a few obituaries with some anecdotes from friends who were mutual friends between James F. Morton and H.P. Lovecraft. So in one of the obituaries by W. Paul Cook, there's a story about Morton's time at the museum. He says, 
because there was one mineral the museum did not have and it was to be found only in one place in the east, a quarry located in Providence, Rhode Island. James knew but one person in Providence, that being Howard Lovecraft. The owner of the quarry was not of a benign disposition and suspicious of everyone. There was one mortgage and one only held on the quarry. That mortgage was part of the small estate owned by Lovecraft. The owner thawed and aided Morton in securing what he wanted. As a result of this mineralizing expedition to Rhode Island, there was piled in the corner of Lovecraft's room for over a year a ton or so of rocks left there by Morton. When I suggested that each chunk be carefully wrapped in tissue paper and the collection packed in boxes and shipped to Morton to get them out of the way, Lovecraft treated the suggestion with a snort. They were going to stay right there until Jim came for them. He eventually did. There's another story in the back of the Letters to James F. Morton anthology that tells of another interesting anecdote about James F. Morton. So this is also by W. Paul Cook, and he tells us, this story came originally from Lovecraft, but was later verified by James. There was a reorganization planned of the Patterson Municipal Museum, and a curator was needed. Friends told Morton about it and urged that he apply for the position. It was a competitive examination, it being necessary that the new curator have a definite program and show ability to carry it out. Hitherto, there had been only a loose organization of the museum and no set plan by which it was run. James at the time was at loose ends and looked over the possibilities. He decided that the museum should specialize in minerals. Patterson lies at the center of a very interesting country, mineralogically, but the museum's mineral collection was small and poorly displayed and arranged. Morton told the group that they would not see him for three weeks. He shut himself in his room with a library. At the end of the three weeks, he appeared and announced that he was ready for the examination. He presented his plan to the museum board, underwent a stiff examination by experts, and was appointed curator. In other words, in three weeks, James had taken a several years course in mineralogy. He had once became widely known in that science. I doubt if such a feat was ever duplicated. So we can sort of see that James F. Morton was a really interesting character. Now, we have this article in the magazine. It's called The Museum and the Collector. And since Lovecraft and Morton were correspondences, they would write letters back and forth to each other, Morton actually sent a copy of this issue to Lovecraft so that he could read what he'd written. And in this collection of letters to James F. Morton, we actually have Lovecraft's response to receiving the magazine. So let's see what Lovecraft has to say about this issue of the Oregon Mineralogist. So this is from March 28th, 1934. He says, This time on your front cover fame as one of the country's leading mineralogists. Good work and say that magazine is a neat little proposition as a whole. I never realized that mineralogy was such a widespread popular institution as to command a chatty, sociable, non-technical press of its own. My idea of a rockological publication was a ponderous sort of sheet full of jaw-breaking disquisitions on crocodileite and cumberlandite that nobody could possibly understand. To those with the right kind of taste, mineral collecting must be almost as fun as tropical fish. Then in the letter, they go on to talk about a story that Morton was going to co-write with magazine editor H.C. Dake, sort of a detective story where uh, there is a plot revolving around mineral-themed and mineral-named characters, which Lovecraft completely shot down and sort of made fun of. But it's incredible to me to f discover this letter, you know, written in the 1930s, the exact period that I'm looking at is the sort of birth decade of American gem cutting, and have this letter from 1934 where Lovecraft not only talks about mineralogy, but the fact that there is a group of people interested in mineralogy enough to hold a magazine together, and also that he would even name H.C. Dake by name. Now, Dake was one of the very important early inspirers for the American gem cutting community, and it's because of the Mineralogist magazine, which eventually started having all kinds of gem cutting information as it came out each month. So once I discovered this letter and discovered the issue that James F. Morton had sent to Lovecraft, 
I wanted to go through the Letters to James F. Morton book and just see if there were any more uh, references to mineralogy or gemology or see what else we could figure out that Lovecraft has to say about gems. So there weren't many, but I did find one from November 6, 1930, where Lovecraft is sort of responding to something that Morton must have said in a previous letter, and he says, as for mineralogy, I don't doubt but that the children get excited, for very colored rocks appeal to the same immature collecting sense that makes them rake in marbles and postage stamps and colored pictures from cigarette packages, if they still have that sort of thing nowadays. And apart from that, I conceded most freely that mineralogy must necessarily appeal to adults of a strongly intellectual type, in whose minds the linkage betwixt the actual mineral substances and cosmic pageantry which formed them is so paramountly visible as not to require a spell-breaking effort for emotional imaginative realization. So it seems that for Lovecraft, mineralogy was not very interesting and did not grip his creative passions. But nevertheless, we do have this very interesting moment in history where the fictional and creative worlds of H.P. Lovecraft and the scientific realms of mineralogy and gemology combine in 1934 in this amazing letter between H.P. Lovecraft and James F. Morton. So I hope this was enjoyable and interesting to you. I know for me, this was two of my passions coming together in a very unexpected way. So I will see you next time as we delve deeper into the history of gems and gem cutting right here on the Gem Cutters Craft. See you then.